All right. We are going to start since it's 11.45. So welcome to Nginx, The Power Within. My name is Helgi. I'm this weird fellow here in the corner. Uh, so I co-founded Orchestra.io. It's a PSP platform as a service. And we got bought by Engineer, the people that paid for your drinks last night. I have, hope everyone is hungover, as hungover as I am, anyway. Uh, so I'm a parent developer. Um, I work on the parent installer. I'm from Iceland originally. And if you want to hackle me during the talk, I'm at H. Uh, I might see your comments. I might not. There's a lot of garbage on Twitter for me. <laughs> um, but Nginx, who here uses Nginx? Ooh, a lot of people. Fun. So this is more of an advanced Nginx talk compared to what most people would be used to. So I'm not going to be explaining the basics of the configuration and things like that. So if you can't follow, my apologies, but it is the advanced version. So Nginx can do multiple things. It's not just a web server. It's a proxy. It's a caching server. It's a mail proxy and multiple, multiple other things. So it's a really, really lightweight but powerful web server or a server in general. But when you're tweaking Nginx, when you're tweaking the configuration and playing around with configuration bits, you kind of have to really, really depend on config test. So if you're using Ubuntu, for example, you can do service Nginx reload, service Nginx restart. But then there's the config test, which will actually tell you, oh shit, your config is broken. Go and fix it. So always use that when you're changing your configuration. But then there's the reload, and it's a really powerful thing to understand how the reload functionality in Nginx works when you're actually reloading the config without taking down the web server. So what happens is that it reloads the config, but in the back, because of the way Nginx works, there's a master process, and then there are multiple children underneath it, the workers, the, the guys that do the actual work. So it actually spins up a new set of workers. So if you say, I want to have 10 processes serving my website, right, on the box, and you say, I'm going to reload the config, it will actually spin up 10 new processes and start spinning the other ones down by telling them, don't accept any more connections, but just finish up whatever you have going on right now. And then it slowly is adding the new ones in there with a new configuration. So customers that are already using your website at that second or that millisecond, they're not going to see any interruption. They're just going to see the old version of it. And then they will just siphon that off and actually kill off the old ones, and now the new ones are in there. And that's how the change works. But the master never changes in that scenario. It's just changing the workers. And that's how you do reloading of configs without taking your website down. But however, you can't always do that if you're changing upstreams, for example. You need to do a restart, so that's something to keep in mind. But the, one of the coolest bit of Nginx is that you can actually do an in-place upgrade of your binary. So you can actually upgrade Nginx without taking down Nginx. And it works in a really similar matter. It's that you have the new binary, and now suddenly there's a new master. Now you have two masters, and they're both load balancing on the same port. And it's doing the same process, where it tries to move all the traffic over to the new master and the new workers. And it's slowly killing off the old ones. And by the end of it, it will actually terminate the old master that uses the old binary. But if that doesn't work, if the upgrade fails for some reason, Nginx detects that, it will actually just move back and say, kill the new master, let's use the old one. So you can actually do in-place upgrades of the binaries. Scary, yes, but fun. It's especially fun when you have thousands and thousands of customers and you're fucking around with stuff like that. Stressful days. Um, oops, there we go. So one of the things that people kind of usually ask me about with Nginx is how do I actually debug all this stuff? People know how to do that in Apache for the most part, but they never really think about how to do it in uh, Nginx. So you can actually enable the debug level. So if you're in your configuration and you're configuring a server or just the overall configuration level. You can do error log, the path, whatever you want, and a debug. The only problem is that you have to compile the thing 
with the debug symbols, essentially. But what it will do is it will give you so much information about what's happening, and it will allow you to debug problems to figure out, oh, is Nginx crashing because of PHP? Is it because of some other library that I have? What are the headers that I'm getting in that are funky that I would otherwise not see? And so on. And the cool thing is, is that the error log system actually allows you to contain the normal error log for your overall website. And if you know there's only a small portion of your website that you won't really want to do this with, you can just define it in the location block. And whenever you hit slash conference, only that will generate the debug information. Because the debug information actually is so much. And if you have a high traffic website, this could be a bad thing. Because you're just filling up the disk. Now, when you're thinking about, oh shit, I want to actually debug my whole website and I don't want to be dealing with location blocks, there's a few different things you can do. And, or at least, actually, the main thing you can do is you can define that only the debug connections, if you're from this IP or this IP range, only those will have the debugging enabled. So you can actually hop in there and do whatever you want and only your requests are producing the extra debugging information in your logs. So that's kind of handy when you just want to make sure you're not actually killing uh, your server. You're not filling it up with disk uh, information. But out from there, it's debugging the rewrite rules. Most people don't realize this. Most people go in and they're trying to write some rewrite thingies in there and they're like, oh shit, it doesn't work. I, I'm getting a 500 or 404 or whatever, you can actually you have to just turn it on, rewrite log on, and as long as you're logging above the notice level, notice level or higher, you'll get information about all the rewrite issues that you're having. If there's any variables that you're trying to use that actually don't exist for whatever reason, if there's just a general problem in your, in your rewrite rule, um, it's really useful for that. And just most people don't realize it. So it's a really, really important thing when you're actually using Nginx and trying to develop something and you're like, you can't actually figure out what's happening with your rewrite rule because it works in PHP. It's just regular expression, right? It works in PHP, it works in Python, it works in Ruby, but Nginx is not accepting it for whatever reason. So it's kind of multiple interesting ways to debug things. Then there's the rewrite module. And the rewrite module is kind of interesting in Nginx, it actually owns a lot of functionality in the configuration file that you're using. Uh, in, if you're using Apache, then you're used to using mod rewrite, yeah? Who has used Apache and mod rewrite? A few of you, okay, most of you. Uh, with that one, you're used to having to enable it. You're used to having to make sure, oh, is it compiled? Can I actually use it? Has it been... Uh, linked against the right libraries and so on. But with Nginx, it's just built in by default. And things that you see in there, they're gonna, it's responsible for all the if statements. If you're looking at the config and it's going to be if statements, file exist checks, returns, and a lot more things. And then there's the other side of it where there's a bunch of Nginx variables that you can use these regular expressions to work against. So, for example, HTTP underscore cookie gives you access to all the cookies. Or you can do HTTP underscore headers, and you get access to all the headers. And most HTTP things you get access to over here. Request method, you can check if it's a get or a post. User agent, the URI, which is the uh, calculated value of the URL that you pass in. And so many more. And you'd use the read-write module play along with that to get a lot of advanced functionality. Uh, I'll post these slides online later, but this is a short link to the, uh, to the documentation page that lists out all the built-in Nginx variables that you can use. And there are a lot of gems in there that you can actually look at and go, oh, okay, this actually saves me a lot of code, or this is a really powerful functionality. But you can also set your own variables. So if you're in the Nginx config, you can do set Helgi high or whatever you want. You can actually create these internal variables that you can then feed into other functionalities. And that's pretty powerful. So for example, 
the example of using nginx variables is the traditional forwarding of domain. You're forwarding the dub 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 to the non dub 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 version for SEO or whatever your boss says. It's a fancy thing to do. So in this case, we're actually using the return, telling it, return this back to the browser, tell it it's a 301, so it's a permanent redirect. The scheme is going to be HTTP or HTTPS, depending on how the user comes in, so you can forward them onto the same thing. And the request URI is going to be whatever the user put in after the domain, so it would be slash, you know, DPC, slash, conference, question mark, beer, equals two. And uh, that would be added in there. So this is an example of Nginx providing us with variables that would otherwise be kind of painful to get. Any questions? Still hungover? All right. I'm not going to fault you. So who here plays around with load balancers from time to time? Not many people. Um, anyone using Nginx for load balancing? Four. Awesome. Uh, so Nginx does a really good job at load balancing stuff. It's a simple round-robin approach by the default. In your upstream for the server, you just define multiple different servers, and it will just randomly send the user to whatever is available. It doesn't really care, like, oh, he was at dub 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 one before. The next request is going to be dub 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 four. At that point, Nginx doesn't really care. It's just sending you wherever. And it's not even keeping track of who has the least traffic. It's just sending you to one of those. But recently, they released something called least connections. So you can actually just define that. And it will send people to whatever has the least amount of traffic or connections anyway currently. So that's kind of powerful and was lacking for the longest time. If anyone has used HA proxy before, that was one of the good things about it is that it would give you the ability to send people to the server that had the least amount of traffic. But in this one, Nginx finally has it. But then there's the IP hashing, which is a co consistent IP routing. And it does that by, if anyone has used the ELBs from Amazon, you can actually do these sticky sessions, as they call them. And this is the same thing. If I come in and I hit dub 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 one, my next request is going to go there over and over and over again. So it maintains an internal hash of your IP and, and a few other bits and pieces and makes sure that you get to the same page over and over again. Um, then there's the different weights. This is a simple round robin approach, but some of these servers are a lot more powerful than the others. So we want the small one to get the least amount of traffic and then the biggest one to get the most traffic. So you can mix and match instead of trying to create a farm of servers that have exactly the same configuration. So by default, the weight, if you don't define it, it's weight number one. So it would have the least amount of weight in the calculation of where to send people. But over here, these are our two biggest servers. And the max fails and the failout time so in 20 seconds, if it fails four times, it will be taken out of rotation for a while. And then just put back in when, it, when Nginx sees that it's working again. So you can use it as a kind of interesting way to just throw servers in there, and then eventually they will either be, if they fall over, then they're just taken out of rotation. But for the longest time until Nginx 1.3.1, uh, which is now 1.4 stable, uh, you couldn't use a weight and IP hashing together. So when you're using the weight, you're actually ending up with people being sent to all these random servers, and you'd have to, in a lot of ways, rely on the session cache servers, like using memcache to use the session, so people would have to hit this single memcache server to maintain the state, essentially, of the session. But now, since 1.3.1, you can actually use those together, and you could define uh, IP hash at the top, and it would just send people to the same server over and over again. So that's really handy when you combine these things together and you want to try to utilize your most powerful servers. 
now caching. Who else used Nginx for the caching aspect? Oh, you have a question there. Sorry. Um, like you sh That's actually a good question. I'm not sure. Uh, if I remember correctly, there are some tricks to do it, but you, I'm pretty sure you cannot put anything into the upstream along those lines. Uh, I think you can just proxy pass it to a specific server. Um, and then there are other modules that are actually kind of powerful in that sense. You can tell it which one to use. But those are additional modules, if I remember correctly. So it's not as good as HA proxy in a lot of ways. HA proxy is, has a lot of options and can do a lot of things. It, this one is just so simple. And for the most case scenarios, it works pretty well. Um, like I said, we use HA proxy at work as well. So it just depends on the use case. Um, Uh, right now, no, I'm, I don't believe so. I've never done that internally with those. But I believe there are other modules for that. So it's fairly raw by default. That's why all these extra modules are giving you the power. Um, for that one, no, not by default. Uh, yeah, not by default. Um, any other questions before we continue? No? Shy, shy people today. Shh. All right, caching. Who here is using um, Nginx for caching, reverse caching? All right, few people. Most people using Varnish or nothing at all? Okay, nothing at all. Awesome. Um, that's cool, that's cool. So Nginx offers caching. Hopefully everyone can see this for the most part. Uh, so when you're using the proxy bit or the caching bit, you're setting a few different things. In this example, we're making sure that the real IP is actually set. So the remote address, if we, if we don't set the X real IP, which is what most libraries expect to see when you're reading um, client requests and all that, and if those are available, that's the traditional thing you have to set just to make sure that the end library knows that this is the real remote address. And if you wouldn't add this in, they would just believe, oh, okay, so the caching server is actually the IP I'm getting. So that's an, an example of the Nginx variables. And then you need to add that forward four and the host if you really want to. It's just a few bits and pieces that you can add to make your proxy server kind of give more information to the backend servers. But the the main bit in this is the proxy cache path where you define where the actual content is going to be stored, the, the weird binary blobs, essentially. And the levels means that there are going to be two directory deep levels because you can run into issues if you have too many files or directories in the, under the same namespace on Linux, at least last I checked. And here you're just defining the name of the cache, uh, how long to live, max size, and how long something can be inactive before it's purged. And the proxy cache you stale is actually kind of cool. Um, it uses the stale data while it's fetching an update from the backend server. So if something goes stale and it has to update it, you're not going to have tens and tens of clients actually go and hit the backend server just to update that one content bit. And that was something Varnish was always pretty good at before, was to um, not basically slam your backend servers as soon as something went stale. So you can serve up the stale stuff while there's one client in the backend fetching the new stuff, and then it was just switch over. So that's kind of handy. And in this case, uh, so you need to define the proxy stuff all at the top level of the HTTP configuration. 
and then we go into the server configuration and we'd have some bunch of configuration here like hostname, Helgi, and so on. But in the location, we'd pass it on. Proxy cache, my cache, which matches here up. And it says, I want to cache 200 and 302 for 60 minutes, so one hour. It's a fairly long cache for 200 response, but it's still fairly reasonable. Before 404, let's cache it for one minute, or not at all, or 20 seconds. So we can actually define different cache levels based on the different errors that you, error codes that you're getting, or HTTP codes, and so on. So it gives you a lot of flexibility to play around with. So for Orchestra, our reverse proxy was actually using a configuration not unsimilar to this, and it works out quite well for a lot of traffic coming through it. I mean, Nginx does fall over from time to time because the memory gets a little bit fragmented and it's not always the best at freeing up the memory. But if you monitor this thing closely, then it's usually not a big deal. Any questions? Comments? Flames? All right. So headers. So manipulating the headers can be a good thing and a bad thing. Um, so with Orchestra, we had the caching layer, and then we had a routing layer built with Nginx internally. So if you go to, if you got a free application back when we had them, what we would do would actually, you'd create an application called DPC, and you'd get dpc.orchestra.io, and we'd route that through the caching layer, and then we'd route that to essentially a load balancing layer that would use a really similar one uh, as the load balancing stuff I was showing you guys earlier. And it would just route you to the right boxes for your free servers and paid servers and so on. But to make sure that the caching could be invalidated easily, we, uh, we allowed people to pass in this one specific variable, underscore orchestra, for example. And there were a few other ones. But what we would do is we'd see, oh, okay, someone passed in underscore orchestra, so we'll pass them through without serving up the cache. And, and the way we did it, we set a cookie so none of the layers would actually try to do any caching until they hit the servers. So in this case, I was just doing add header set cookie. I was setting it to the top path of whatever domain I was in and say, stay alive for two seconds just so this request is not going to be cached anywhere. Um, so in the header module, you can either add headers or you can set expires. It doesn't, the default header module doesn't offer anything else. You can't modify headers, you can't remove headers, and so on. So in this case, I'm saying it, it's all these um, images and JavaScript files, they expire in one hour. So we send the expire to the browser, and you can say forever, in the past, and a few other. It actually has, like, you can just literally say forever, and it understands what that means. But to, um, to use Ang some of the more advanced, within quotes, functionalities of Nginx or more, ex more exotic functionalities of Nginx, you have to use the modules. And you have to kind of get into the whole, oh, okay, now I need to compile it in. So when you get a new module, you go to the Nginx source where you compile things, and in this case, we're compiling this thing called headers more, so more header functionality that you can do stuff with. And you go into the source of your Nginx, and you say, configure dash, 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 or dash, dash, add module, and then pass to where you extracted the module. And then it just configure, then it just compiles it again using the new module. And you just do make and make install, and voila, you suddenly have a new module to play around with. So in this case, um, the, what they call the HTTP headers more module, when you can access it here, it just goes to the Nginx configuration and documentation page. But another wall of code, it's really powerful, this module. And if you're doing a lot of things where you want to get in a request and play around with the headers and, for example, make Nginx clean up the headers based on what the clients have sent into you before it hits your application. So... In this case, these are the inbound 
the outbound headers, so, so they have a concept of outbound headers, so what your application sends to your users, and then inbound headers, what the user is sending you. And this is the outbound headers. So in this case, we can actually fake out the server part that otherwise PHP and Nginx itself would set by default. So in case, for some reason, we just want to make sure this wasn't modified at all by our application. Let's say we're hosting something for a customer, and, they're, and we're a VPS or whatever, and we want to make sure things get outputted with our fancy server name for whatever reason. In this case, I'm just setting more headers, more custom headers, and I'm making sure the return is going to be, I'm saying that we can support these formats. That's the dash T is for is type. And then the dash S, that's a good question. Status, yeah, it's a, you can set the status with a message, right? I'm not sure why that is. It's supposed to be uh, orange. That threw me off a little bit. But yeah, you're sending back the status stuff. And then you can actually clear out headers. So for example, if you want to clear out the transfer encoding and content type just because you think your application is doing the wrong thing or you don't want them to be sending these things back because you detected, oh, this person is on an iPad so they can't receive this or you know, just do a user-specific change. And then you can do stuff on location. You can do it location-based as well. It doesn't have to be like on the top level. So you can do different things for different locations. And the input headers, um, this is from when I was in, in the UK. <laughs> but you're making sure that things are set properly for the input headers. And you can actually replace things. So if you could do more set input headers and you do dash R, which is replace, it will only replace it if it's set. So if it's not set, it will not try to just add it in there randomly. So that's kind of powerful is being able to replace whatever is in there just in case you decided to change your mind depending on what people sent you or what your application was telling you to send out. So there's a lot of power in that and you can do a lot of different things with it. Headers are fun. Now, some of this is kind of more mundane. It helps you set things up for the m more kind of fun usages. And let's do a little bit of kind of blue sky thinking. So Memcache, who here uses Memcache? Good chunk, cool. Anyone using Redis? Uh, for a few, the other half. <laughs> so this is the kind of usual request loop that you would see in a normal PHP application. There would, a request would come in, hit Nginx, go to PHP, PHP would go, oh, okay, I actually want to fetch this data from Memcache instead of MySQL, right? And then it goes there, gets it, returns it back, and PHP does something with it, and you make it look fancy and return it back to Nginx. Especially when you're dealing with something like APIs where you could be storing the JSON result already in Memcache because you already calculated it. So you're just to do a, you're doing a fast pass through essentially, but PHP is still in the way. It's still doing stuff. So what if we could change it like this? What this means is that Nginx, when it gets in a request, it goes and checks memcache. And it asks, I have a key here, I have a question, and this is the key that I expect you to be storing it as. Do you have that for me? And if it doesn't have it, then it goes back to Nginx and says, no, I don't have it. And then Nginx can go, hey, PHP, I need this stuff because I got this request. Can you make it happen for me? It's like, oh, yeah, sure, here's the result, and PHP is also setting the value in memcache. So for the next time the same thing is requested, Nginx could talk directly to memcache and return it. So it would never hit PHP. And because you're cutting out this whole piece of software from most of the request loop, you get a lot more performance. Like, you can see upwards of 300%, 400%, depending on what you're doing, because you're just returning a pre-calculated value. So there are multiple different memcache modules in, uh, in Nginx, but there's one built in. It's the least, it has the least amount of features, but it has enough features. 
Um, so in this case, I'm actually doing a lot of, like this piece here, these three lines are all you need, really. But what I'm doing is that I'm making sure that it's only a get request because the default module doesn't support setting anything in memcache, whereas actually some of the other ones do. You'd have to compile them, but this one is just built in, so it's easy to get up and running with. But in this case, we're saying request method, if it's not get, we're actually going to rewrite the whole thing using that dot, using at fallback, which is the named location block at the bottom. And here we do all the fast CGI PHP stuff. And so at the top, we're just checking, oh, are you not a get request? OK, go to the bottom. And then we go through the whole thing and basically try to figure out, are you asking for JSON, XML, HTML, setting the right content type if we need to, doing some rewrites and, and so on, just to make sure we have the correct keys. And then here, memcached key is a variable that you have to set. And this is the variable that uh, Nginx will use against memcache to look for things. So in this case, we use URI, the URI variable, question mark, and the arguments. The arguments passed in with the get request, right? And if that's set, it will then use memcached pass and connect to memcache, and voila, it would work. And it would say, oh, OK, I got a 500, 404, 405. We fall back to the fast CGI bit. So it would do PHP if it was getting a 400, uh, 404 or 500. <coughs> so with all of this, you're hitting memcache and delivering things if they're available. Otherwise, you fall back on PHP. So just to highlight, this is the only bit of the whole equation you need it to make this work. So now you have Nginx talking to memcache, and it's serving up whatever you have in there if the key is set. And you just need to make sure that PHP is setting the same key if you're writing things in there. Now, like I said, if you use some of the other modules, the other Nginx, uh, memcache modules, there's like two or three other ones, some of them can actually set things as well clear things out and mess around with things a good bit more. But like I said, it's not built in by default. So depending on what you want to do. If you want to throw up a really quick, fast API, you can use something like that and boom, performance. Any questions so far? Yeah. Oh, you mean like here? No, it won't do it. When oh. It falls back. oh, when it falls back. Uh, yeah, you'd have to, you're just returning at that point. You're, you're actually returning the whole web page from, from yeah, PHP. No, not, not the default module, no. So you'd have to do it from PHP. PHP would have to talk to Nginx and go and set it at that point. So this, this module, the default memcache module, only fetches. It does no setting for you at all. Some of the other ones would, but you'd have to define it yourself. And some of them can do some automatic deals for you. But most of the time, not much. So you'd have to do most of the things yourself. I'm curious about how availability for memcache is on Nginx. What if it's just, it's just not up in there? Are there any uh, you'd use the upstream bit as well. You can use upstream for most things. And I'll actually show you how to connect to other things, like MySQL through upstream. So you can use it for most things. So you can actually define it like a round robin kind of approach if you want to do that with memcache. But since memcache doesn't, unless you're using membase, they don't actually synchronize. There were two questions first here. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I found the rendering of this over proxy caching. When to use this over proxy caching? Um, it's just you're using memcache already, and the proxy cache may not give you the same flexibility that you want. Uh, it's kind of the, you have more control over it, in my experience. I feel using the reverse proxy sometimes not to be as stable, and here I'm actually using exactly what I need, and I can then use PHP to manipulate whatever is in there as well. So you can 
use different actions. So let's say like you only hit this with a really small portion of your website. And then other portions, when users were going to stuff that doesn't talk to Memcache directly, but you use those portions to set things in Memcache kind of thing. So it's the difference between the reverse cache, it's just caching the whole thing, and it doesn't give you the flexibility to couple things together, in my opinion. But that's just a personal preference. Oh, you had the same question? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's just a preference, really. Plus, also, this is being stored on a remote server versus the reverse proxy. Each proxy has to get a copy of the cache. So if you have 10 of them, they're not always all going to be the same thing. They could always be in a different state, whereas with this one, you're more guaranteed to have the same state. So you can use this, for example, as session storage and use Nginx to deal with all the session stuff uh, and make sure that you send to the right server, for example, or, or whatnot. Uh, any other questions before we continue? No. Okay. So, so there's another module that I find highly, highly useful. It's called setMisc. And you can access it at the bottom there when we get the slides. But it's just called setMisc. Uh, it adds extra things into the rewrite module, which is kind of powerful. So in this case, I have a request, and I want 12 beers. And I would get 12 beers. But in this case, I forget to set it. In Nginx, it doesn't really do anything for you. You have to actually check it in PHP and make sure, oh, okay, where is my default? But over here, I can use set amount and then arc underscore amount. And arc underscore gives you access to all the get parameters. So if we had, oh, so if this was called Bob, then this would have to be arg underscore Bob to access it. So in this case, I'm just setting amount, the variable, to this arg amount, just so I'm not playing around on the main argument uh, variable all the time. And I'm see, doing, oh, it set it if it is empty. And if it's empty, I want 9,999 beers. Uh, so if you pass in the last one, it would just default to that, and PHP would get 9,999. So this doesn't exist by default in Nginx. You'd have to make sure that module is available to you. But it gives you that function. And it gives you a few other functions, actually. Over here, same example, but extend it. Uh, so by default, the arc variables, they're actually escaped, because Nginx takes it and makes sure everything is escaped, so it's not doing funny things to your PHP code or whatnot, and you don't have to deal with that. But in this case, we have to use this function called set unescaped URI. So it's actually taking the value and making sure it's unescaped. So we can then quote it for in a SQL string. Otherwise, it wouldn't function. It would basically start doing these funny things like back in the day when people were doing add slashes and stuff to do my SQL queries in PHP. Uh, so we have to unescape it just to get out of the dilemma that arc adds in there. But now we've quoted it as a SQL string. And there's actually sets, uh, quote, Postgres and JSON. So you can actually quote what should be a JSON string that you're going to do something with. And also, yeah, the, these arcs do not, you cannot actually post. They just don't work with post at all whatsoever. Only get. So this module is actually kind of interesting because it offers all these different set functions. Set MD5, set SHA1. You can encode and decode base64. So when you're doing APIs and stuff like that, and you're dealing with base64, you can actually be getting the base64 from the user, decoding it, doing something with it, encoding it again, and sending it onwards. So you can actually use a lot of this stuff to do that. The set HMAC SHA1 and secure random alphanum. You can start ran, uh, generating random URLs on the fly. Uh, so in this case, we're actually just going to, so the echo is not in by default. It's yet another module. It's called the echo module. But it would just output whatever value is there. And just using it as an example is really useful for debugging, actually. But in this case, we're setting raw to secret, and now we're doing SHA-1 encoding on the raw, setting it into a whoop, 
variable and echoing out the whoop. And you'd have a SHA-1 string suddenly dealt with. Uh, in this one, HMAC, we're actually doing HMAC authentication in a lot of ways in there. We're setting the secret, which should be super duper secret. Uh, this string that we got in from the user or whatever, and then we're creating a signature out of the whole thing, base encoding it and returning it. So you can actually create an HMAC authentication system in Nginx using memcache or MySQL, which I'm going to show you. We don't have many slides left, by the way. Um, so it's, a, it's called the Drizzle module, but there's a Postgres module as well. And there's also, by the way, a Radish module that can replace the memcache one, depending on what you want to use. So it's called the Drizzle module. It can connect to Drizzle, MariaDB, MySQL, and so on. Uh, in this case, we just do upstream called MySQL backend. So with memcache, we would, we would have done a memcache backend in this kind of upstream fashion. And you can add multiple different databases. And by default, it would round robin. Right? So you set values, connecting details, database names, password, username, and so on. You can have multiple of them in there. But now what we can start doing is, like before, we were uh, unescaping the URI, quoting it, and then Drizzle query, we're inserting stuff into it. And we're just passing it to the backend upstream that we just defined. So now when you're hitting something, and you can go, OK, let's just say we're doing HMAC authentication. We can actually hit memcache. OK, the user is not there. The keys are not there. The tokens are not there. OK, let's fall back on using MySQL or use MySQL to insert referral IDs or something. And you just want to keep it really low touch and out of your code. But you want to be able to do it when people request stuff. But this, by default, there's a protocol behind it called RDS, and it's a binary protocol. So you're not going to access any of this by default. Um, it's not JSON and not, no nothing like that by default, but I'll show you how to make it so. Uh, one thing I just want to touch on real quick, like I said, Nginx doesn't expose post variables, which makes the whole MySQL bit like not as useful because we don't want to do everything through get. But there's a thing called, it's a form module. And you can actually start setting post variables. And it starts catching it for you and doing stuff with it. So it's just a yet another module. I don't have examples for it, but I thought it was useful enough to mention since we're talking about inserts and so on. But in this case, again, kind of the same thing as before. We're just selecting it based on the get parameters. So you could actually, in theory, try to hit memcache. And if memcache fails, the fallback is MySQL. And if MySQL fails, the fallback is PHP. So you can do a lot of the kind of cool interactions. Like I said, it doesn't output uh, JSON by default. But it's possible to actually output JSON and CSV use it by using these two modules by the guy that actually wrote the whole Drizzle thing. He just called it the RDS protocol. And now these two things can output JSON or CSV. In this case, you just do the same thing as before, but say, RTS underscore JSON on. And at that point, whatever comes back from the MySQL thing returns as a JSON <laughs> string. And if you're inserting something and you have this on, you get the ID as a JSON string as well. So you get the, actually the insert ID of it. And you can do something with that if you really want to. Um, so that's kind of just random things I wanted to show you guys and show you the power of building. You can actually build a whole web application in Nginx at this point. And you can actually add in Lua programming if you want to as well, if you want to do more complex stuff. So uh, it wouldn't be too hard to actually build out, let's say, a simple API server in Nginx. Why not? You know? <laughs> um, but I believe we're out of time. Um, I'll be around the conference if you guys want to ask me any of the Nginx questions or have a chat. Um, please rate the talk at that joined in URL. And I'll also put the slides on there. So like, if you want to get the slides later on, they will be on there. I'll tweet about it as well. You can drop me an email in time as well. If you have any Nginx questions, that's not a big deal at all. Um, but yeah, the conference organizers and myself would really appreciate if you rated the talk at some point in the next week or two. So uh, thanks a lot.